neuroengineering. How novel methods in neuroscience open up new horizons in research and therapy. Carl Dyseroff, Stanford University. When the wall came down, I was taking my first neurobiology class at Harvard. So, uh, one of the most profound walls that we face is looking inside ourselves, into our own brains, into our own minds, understanding how it works, but how it fails to work. And this is one of the biggest, most interesting, but also urgent challenges that I think uh, we face. If we can explain that, we can solve a lot of problems that we have in the world. And I am a psychiatrist. I see patients with treatment-resistant depression. I'm also an engineer in the bioengineering department at Stanford. And I'm trying to understand how things like motivation and hope and effort uh, arise from the properties of neural circuits. Just as we can understand that the heart is a pump, and we can see that's what it's trying to do, and understand how it fails in its pumping action and design better treatments and understand it better, I'd like to come to that sort of understanding with our students and colleagues uh, about uh, motivated behavior and about psychiatric disease. Now, the human brain is an incredible challenge, more than 80 billion neurons connected in an intricate way. Uh, the events, the electrical events that are used to communicate are short, a millisecond long. They're tiny picoamps. They're entwined like spaghetti, entangled, absolutely. That would be the right use of the word entangled. And so we start with simpler situations. We start with animals, and we use optical tools. And I want to tell you about three optical tools that let us exchange information with intact uh, brains. Some of these involve playing in instructions through fiber optics that are very precise and allow us to understand very complex behaviors. Other tools involve uh, making brains transparent and looking through them and seeing their wiring and their connections without having to disassemble them. In other methods, we actually observe the activity of the neurons as they operate within the behaving uh, animal. And these optical technologies work together to help us understand uh, these very difficult questions. And so the first one is something that we called optogenetics. It's a combination of optics and genetics to deliver instructions to the brain. And microorganisms that are small, like algae, single-celled algae, and ancient forms of bacteria, archaebacteria, they make light-activated proteins that move current, that create electrical current in response to light. And what we did uh, was we said, if we could put this into some neurons, but not other neurons, we could achieve selective control. Just as an electrode can't distinguish different kinds of neurons that are nearby, if we could put some of these genes borrowed from the biosphere into one kind of neuron but not another, we could flash light and play in instructions that would be cell type specific. Millisecond precision, keeping up with the speed of the brain. And we did this uh, building on a long history of work of basic biologists, not neuroscientists, who were studying these proteins for their own sake. And so it's a real testament to the value of basic science. And we did a number of different uh, experiments. I'll just highlight a couple here. You can flash blue light patterns, and you can get these spiky electrical events to happen in neurons. These are called action potentials, and you can play in this millisecond precision uh, control. Now, I'll give you an example of the sort of experiment you can do. So, you know, we want to find the cellular activity patterns that cause behavior in health and disease. And so what we do is we package those proteins into very safe viruses, and we inject them into the brain. This is a mouse brain. And we can use genetic tricks to make sure they're only made in some cells but not others. And we can deliver light through fiber optics now to control those cells. We can also deliver a fiber optic somewhere else, and then we get those cells that live here and send their connections there. We call that projection targeting. So instead of controlling a city or another city, you're controlling the highway between the cities. And that turns out to be very powerful uh, and, and very instructive in terms of understanding how the brain works. In fact, all these, you don't need to read them, but these are all studies that have been used by us and others to probe the neural basis of anxiety and depression in animal models using this principle. And I'll show you an example. This is what we call an elevated plus maze. And this is a mouse. It's got a fiber optic plugged in. 
And you can see the animal is spending almost all its time in this arm and not this arm of the maze. And the reason is it's, this one has elevated walls, so the animal feels safer there. So this is an anxiety-like behavior in a rodent. They avoid open spaces where they're exposed and at risk, apprehension in the absence of immediate threat. But we started playing in an activity pattern in one projection, doesn't matter what it is, from one part of the brain to another, right here. When this blue letter comes on, that's when we started playing in this pattern. And for the first time, the animal goes out into the open arms of the maze. It doesn't change anything else about its behavior. It doesn't change its speed. It still looks, it still explores the closed arms as well as the open arms. It's not as if it's become risk-seeking, but it simply doesn't care that there's an open or closed arm. And when we turn off the light, it goes back to this original behavior. So you can actually now come to a circuit understanding of anxiety and individual features of anxiety using this sort of method. And we and others are playing in complex patterns to different projections from one part of the brain to another to understand what actually causes these complex behaviors. And that's been incredibly exciting. We've also been able to observe activity along projections, not just play in, but read out see how activity is normally moving along these highways. And we call this method fiber photometry. It's very similar, but you can plug in a fiber optic into an animal and collect back information. In this case, using fluorescence that's linked to neural activity. Certain kinds of neural activity are strong enough that they can create a fluorescence signal if you put in a particular sensor into those neurons. And here's a really interesting example. Mice like sugar water, just like we do and it's very rewarding, they'll work for it. And so we looked in the dopamine neurons deep in the brain of these uh, animals, buried in an area called the ventral tegmental area, which we have too. Uh, and we looked and we listened to these neurons, the dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area, while, while the animal was licking at a little spout for sucrose. And here was just a control experiment where there's no sensor and each of these little red bars is a, when the animal licks and there's absolutely no signal. But when we put in a fluorescent marker that lets us listen in on neural activity through this fiber optic, whenever the animal licks, we can see that little reward signal happening in the dopamine neurons. So during free behavior, we can actually observe in real time, deep in the brain, the activity in a specific kind of cells. It goes beyond reward. We can look at complex social behaviors. I'm gonna, this is a funny notation, but it's activity along a projection from one brain area to another. And I'm going to show you two movies, Social Interaction of a Mouse. They are quite social also, and they like being social. And also a novel object interaction. They like new things, new objects, and they'll go and explore both another mouse and an object. But what you're going to be seeing is activity from not at point A and not at point B, but activity along the connection from point A to point B, the traffic along the highway. And point A is the dopamine neurons, and point B is a downstream structure called the nucleus accumbens that's a target for drugs of abuse. And here is this red bar, that's the signal along this projection, a signal nobody was able to see before. And you can see when the other mouse is put in a big spike in the activity of these, of activity along these dopamine neurons going in this particular projection. And then it goes down as they separate, but as they come back together, it goes up again. And you can watch in real time the animal's reward uh, during a complex social behavior. And even though they like novel objects, here a golf ball is going to be put in, there's uh, much less of a reaction. It uh, hangs back and then does come and approach it as it uh, feels uh, seemingly compelled to do. And there's a little blip up, but it's much less. And so if any of you have a concern of somebody who likes golf more than social interaction, we know the circuit to, to target now. So. We've also been able to engineer nature. These opsins, they come from nature. They are from algae and bacteria, but we, together with our colleagues, have been able to get, look at very high resolution at how these proteins are made and engineer them for our own purpose. We call this a crystal structure. This is what one of these proteins looks like at the nanoscale. And it's got a couple little holes through which ions flow. The current flows through here and here. And we were able to re-engineer that little hole to make it move instead of positive ions, negative ions, and turn it from a stimulatory into an inhibitory tool. And we did that using patch clamp, which is a beautiful technique uh, that's been in neuroscience for 35 years. We bring in a little glass pipette and listen in on a neuron, and we flash light, and these are neurons that are just growing in a dish. We're testing these different engineered opsins to see if we did the right thing, gave it a new property or not. And we actually were able to turn 
one of these opsins called a channel rhodopsin into an inhibitor. And so now blue light shuts off electroactivity instead of driving it. And so this is the exciting thing about nature. You can, we take our ideas from nature just you know, as, as, as many others who you've heard from uh, uh, do, but we can also improve on nature in a very uh, guided way. Here's one final thing I want to share for you, which is, you know, I've talked about playing in activity, I've talked to you about reading out activity, but what about seeing the wiring itself? What about seeing the structure? This is a big challenge. Brains are not transparent. Many organisms have gone to great lengths to become transparent. This is a picture you can find on the internet. There are many fish that are nearly transparent. They've gone so far, some of them, as to abandon blood. They no longer have hemoglobin and red blood cells. But the central nervous system tends to remain uh, opaque. And the reason for that is scattering. Light scatters at lipid water interfaces, at lipid aqueous interfaces. And the brain, because of all the insulation that all these wires have, could not be a more jumbled mess of scattering influence than it is. And that's fundamental to its, to its function. But we've been able to take non-living brains, though, but still, this is a step, and turn them transparent so you can read text right through them. This is a mouse brain made transparent. And this is incredibly valuable because you no longer have to slice the brains into very thin sections and try to reassemble them. You can actually see the structure intact. And we call this method clarity. This is a mouse brain where all the green label is long-range connections from one part of the brain to another. And what I'll show you is a movie, a completely intact mouse brain, never sliced, never cut apart. And you can fly through this basically with a joystick, look around, see what interests you, Look at all these long-range connections that proceed from one part of the brain to another. And all these little red dots, all these little blue, uh, green dots are uh, neurons, and these stripy things are connections, axons that go from one region to another. So this uh, is a technique that by itself is powerful, but also in combination with optogenetics. You can imagine doing an experiment where you play in uh, control over some neurons, or you observe the activity in some neurons, and then from that very same animal, you then go look at its wiring of those exact same neurons, and you can come in that way to a deeper understanding of how brains work in health and disease. So these techniques, you know, the interesting thing about clarity, how does it work? Well, we get rid of all the lipids. Their chemical structure is such that they're not bound by a structure we build in place called a hydrogel that keeps all the interesting molecules, all the proteins and nucleic acids like DNA in place, but you lose the fat, you lose the lipids, and that removes the scattering influence and makes it so that you can see through. The fact that all the lipids are gone means you can also put in labels and you can paint the different kinds of cells, different colors, red, green, green or blue, uh, and so you can see not only that the cells are there, but what kind they are. And of course, that's crucial. You can't, can imagine looking at a circuit diagram. It would really help to see not just that there's a, a circuit element there, but what kind it is. And if it's a resistor, how, how big of a resistor is it? And we can also look at DNA uh, and RNA with nucleic acid probes. This also works in samples from human tissue. And this is one of its uh, uh, powerful strengths. We took this sample from a brain bank, uh, and we can see, trace the connections going from one part of the human brain to another over long distances without slicing or, or deconstruction. And we've put a lot of these tools online, uh, uh, Clarity Resource Centers and Optogenetics uh, Resources, and a number of groups have started using this. For example, just uh, Clarity uh, alone, there's been some recent work uh, published in Alzheimer's from other groups, multiple sclerosis models from other groups, pain syndromes from other groups. And so you can see this is the opportunity we now have, and I think one of the biggest principles is the future. We're going to delve into the circuit basis of neuropsychiatric disease, but also it's a, this whole story is a, a useful principle that the key tools came from the biosphere, from ancient organisms that uh, are ancient and old and rare. So thank you very much.